Let's, let's go back to Lagbaum. So Lagbaum, which is this very misunderstood holiday. Okay, what do we know about Lagbaum? What, well, like, what is this day? What are we supposed to be commemorating? 33rd day. So it's the 33rd day no. of Sfilat Omer. Okay. Yeah, but uh, yeah, so, but so what? We, do, we have to do 49 days of... of, right. of no, what, is, what do we know about this day? What is the, uh, whole, what is the whole idea? They, they, they do, uh, what do they call it? The, the, the fire. fire. Okay. The fire. I don't yeah. know what, what a big name, the big there's the fire. In Morocco, in Morocco, I never heard of the plague. Okay, good. So there's the plague. There's the plague. That's the famous thing. There was a student of Rabbi Akiva that died, and that's why we're mourning. Okay, so that's what we have to figure out. We have to figure this out. So it's something to do with Rashbi, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Okay, Rashbi. But Rabbi Akiva students died. Well, student okay. yeah. So the, the way that it's usually told is that Rabbi Akiva had 24,000 students that all died yeah. of a plague. They didn't each other, yeah. Because, because they, they didn't respect each other. So let's, let's go right to the source. And then it's in Masechet Yevamot, which that's where it comes from, which is actually interesting because the Daf Yomi next week is actually going to be this page, which is pretty cool because the chances of that like synchronizing is very rare when you consider like the Jewish calendar cycle and the Daf Yomi cycle and so I know it's interesting that's next week so if you're doing Daf Yomi I think it's Sunday uh, or sometime next week so <clears throat> it's uh, Yevamot page 62 so it's like this Rabbi Akiva. so Rabbi Akiva had 12,000 pairs of students remember Rabbi Akiva lives 2000 just under 2000 years ago like 1900 years ago he had 12,000 pairs of students, meaning 24,000 students. So, because remember, first we had the, the first, the great revolt when the Romans destroyed the temple. Then you had Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai was, at the time, was the leader. Remember that story? How he saved the, the rabbis, he saved Yavne and so on. His students, like we're reading Pirkei Avot now, we're going to read this week. He had five main students, right? So his student, Rabbi Yoshua and Rabbi Eliezer, those are the two great Rabbi Yoshua and Rabbi Eliezer, who were the teachers of Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva studied in Lod with Rabbi Eliezer. So the Great Revolt was in the year 70. Now this is the, this is the time of the Bar Kokhba Revolt. So there's the second big war between, some say third, between the Jews and the Romans. So he had 12,000 pairs of students, Rabbi Akiva. <clears throat> And Migivat ad Antipares, or Antipres or Antipatres, he, from, in these two cities, between Givat and Antipatres, he had 12,000 pairs of students. Vechulan metu, and they all died, Beferek Echad, at one time, Mipnei Shelona Hagu Kavod Zelazeh. So they all died because they didn't respect each other, presumably. Which is strange, which we'll see in a moment. And then it says, Ve'aya ha'olam shamem. And the world was like seemingly desolate. The Jewish world was desolate because all these like rabbis and Jewish disciples were killed. Ad sheba Rabbi Akiva etzel raboteinu shebadarom until he came, Rabbi Akiva came south and ushana laim Rabbi Meir ve Rabbi Yehuda ve Rabbi Yossi ve Rabbi Shimon ve Rabbi Eliezer ben Shemua. So he found five new students and he taught them. Vehem himidu Torah otasha. So they restored the Torah at that time. So all of his students died. Apparently, others died too. Like there was basically no, the world was desolate. The Jewish world was desolate. And then Rabbi Akiva found five new students and, tra and trained them. And they kept the Torah alive. But why do we need 2,000 years later? To oh, we'll get to that. We'll get to. Let's see. Let's see. Exactly. Let's see. That, that's what we're going to get to. Yeah. That must have been very depressing for him. For sure. 24,000 right. students. Right. Remember, he himself was killed. So we're going to get to that as well. Yeah. And Tana, and it was further taught that Kula metu mi Pesach v'ad atzeret. So remember, we said that Tzeret is Shavuot, right? So every, they all died in this one period between Pesach and Shavuot. And then it continues as Amar Rav Chama uh, or Rav Chama Bar Abba. So what did they say? That Kula metu mi Tara'a. They all died some kind of bad death. We don't know how they died. Some kind of bad death. And then, Amar Rav Nachman, that they died from Askara. Askara is like a, some kind of suffocation, disease. We're not sure what it is. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Maybe. Some kind of respiratory. They, they translate it as croup, but like, whatever. It's some kind of uh, yeah. respiratory illness, so that they all died. But we're not sure. That's Rav Nachman's opinion. And today, that's kind of like become the standard, that they died of this plague of Askara, and because they didn't respect each other. Okay, now the Me'iri comments on this, 
because here it says from Pesach to Shavuot. So he says, Uskar kan shekula metu mi Pesach ve'ad atzeret. And the Kabbalah be'yad the Geonim, we know from the Geonim that the rabbis, the, or the big rabbis after the Talmudic period, the next period, the time of the Geonim, that really, Shebeyom Lag Ba'omer, uh, that it all actually ended on Lag Ba'omer. That the mita stopped, the noagim mitoch kach, shelo leita anot bo, vechen noagim mitoch kach, shelo leisa isha, mi pesach ad otozman. So that's what the Meiri says. So it really we know, even though the Gemara says that it was from Pesach to Shavuot, we actually know from the time of the Geonim that it wasn't actually like that. It wasn't that long. They stopped dying on Lag Ba'omer, and that's why there's a tradition um, not, you know, to, not to have parties and things like that, not to get married during this time as well. Okay. So that's the Meiri. Now, there's something strange here. There's a few strange, there are a few questions come up right away. One is your question. If the students didn't treat each other well. That means they weren't righteous. And they were punished for that. Why are we mourning them? Why mourn? Technically, if they're, they're not tzaddikim, why would we mourn for them? We don't mourn for anybody else that much. You don't mourn in, uh, mourning tzaddikim 2,000 years later. Exactly. You celebrate the Eulah once, once exactly. a year and they they celebrate their life as opposed and, to mourn their death. Exactly, yeah. that's right. Yeah, and why mourn at all? Yeah. Why mourn if they weren't even righteous enough and God punished them by exterminating them? Why would we mourn? That's one question. Yeah. Uh, a few other questions. What other questions would you have on this? Well, we didn't ask the Malak Allah. So, it ties into the first one. So, I mean, how could you be, a, how could you be, how could you be considered a righteous or a poor individual if you don't have the basic decency for sure. to respect not even for sure. let alone your own there's, there's an even more fun and, and that goes back to a fundamental teaching of Rabbi Akiva because what was Rabbi yeah, Akiva's exactly yeah. so Rabbi Akiva what do we know about Rabbi Akiva he was famous for teaching for instilling in everybody that the most important thing is to love your fellow as yourself mm -hmm. and that's what it says in Sifra from that time period it says, kamocha, Rabbi Akiva omer, klal gadol batorah, that according to Rabbi Akiva, this is the greatest principle of the Torah, right? So and this... come out after they died and then he realized, oh, this must be a principle? Or, or no, was this because to he died this? also. What? He was also died, Rabbi Akiva. Ooh. Rabbi Akiva, he was also killed very shortly after. Yeah, but he wasn't at the same time with his 24 Talmudim, no? Maybe he was. Let's see, maybe he was. Because when did this happen? Okay. No, no, so we have to piece it all together. I, I don't piece, it piece it all together. together. Right, piece, piece it all together. So the question here is that the Sifra seem, like, doesn't seem to match the Gemara because Rabbi Akiva's whole thing was that the greatest Torah principle was to love your fellow. But then the Gemara is telling us all his students then died because they didn't love their fellow. Yeah. But that was like his whole thing. That doesn't make sense. Yeah, exactly. That was the whole foundation of his teaching, right? So there's a clear contradiction here. Right. Plus, why would we mourn them then? If they couldn't even fulfill this fundamental Torah principle, why would we mourn them? Let's see how the story continues. Because now we want to know what happened to Rabbi Akiva here. This is in Masechet Brachot. Rabbi Akiva Le'ariga. They took Rabbi Akiva to execute him, the Romans. It was Zman Chayat Shmaya, it was time to say the Shema. Ve'ayu sorkin et psaro b'masrekot shel barzel. So they, basically, they raked him with iron, uh, rakes, with iron metal. Um, so they tortured him to death, right? Ve'aya mekabel alav ol malchut shamayim. But he accepted the yoke of heaven upon himself. And Amrulo Talmidav, his students asked him, Rabbeinu Adkan, like, really? Like, even now you're going to still have all that emunah and uh, you're, like, getting tortured and executed? And he told them, remember the famous words that he told them? He was waiting. Right? Like, his whole life, he was always wondering how he could fulfill the, in the Shema, when we say, What does that mean to love God with all your soul? That even if you lose your, that God takes away your soul, or that the, your soul's being taken away, that you still love God. So, Amarti said, When can I fulfill this to, to love God with all my soul? Now, like I finally have the opportunity, so how can I not fulfill it? To love God with all my soul, even when they're taking my soul away from me. Right? That's an incredible level. Very. That's, a, that's, that's Rabbi Akiva. That's why we're still talking about him 2,000 years later. Yeah. So, 
What did he do? Ayam me'arich be'echad, and as he said Shema, he extended the echad, ad she'yatstan nishmato be'echad, and his soul came out when he said echad, he died. Yatsta bat kol ve'amra, and at that moment a voice from heaven called out, Ashrecha Rabbi Akiva, she'yatstan nishmatcha be'echad, that, you know, you're praiseworthy are you, that your soul actually came out of you at that particular, uh, you know, it can't be better than that, I mean, it was a horrible thing, but right at the end of Shema, that he said it with such kavanah, and his soul came out, unbelievable. So we see from this that he was executed by the Romans. And remember, his students are there watching this, right? So, good question. It doesn't say. It says that his students saw him being executed. Good question. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Now, the thing is, after that first Gemara that we saw implied that after the 24,000, he, got, he got five new ones. But there are other sources, other Midrashim that say that he actually had those students before. For example, that he taught Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai for like 13 years before and so on. And there's another Gemara that when Rabbi Akiva was in jail before he was killed, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai came to him and said to teach me something. And Rabbi Akiva said, what are you talking about? I'm in jail. Like, the guards are here. You want me to teach you Torah? It's forbidden to teach Torah, right? And there's a whole story like that. So actually, even though that source in Yevamot implied that the 24,000 died and then he found new ones, other sources suggest that they were already his students. Maybe out of the 24,000 some students that he had, they were the, maybe the younger ones, but they survived and went on to become great. So the story continues. Now we're going to go jump to Masachet Sanhedrin. This is how Gemara is, right? You got to piece together all kinds of different... If you want to understand anything, you have to be able to jump around. It's all hyperlinks. That's how Gemara is. You got to go over there. You got to go there. Exactly. So <clears throat> Sanhedrin says an even more incredible story and tragic story. So Gizra Malchut Arisha'a Gzera, so the evil Roman Empire decreed Al Israel Shakola Somech Yareg that anybody who gives smicha, meaning trains new rabbis, will be killed. Right? So it was forbidden to do that. Vechola Nismach Yareg, anybody who gets smicha, anybody who goes for like rabbinic learning will be killed. The Ir Shesomchinba Ticharev, and the city in which this takes place will be. Um, yeah, flattened. Vetchumin shastomchin bahen yeakru that and bound, any borders uh, inside which this will happen will be uprooted, and uh, and we know that the Romans did that because remember how did Israel Judea become supposedly Palestine? The Romans did that, right? The Romans got so fed up with the Jews constantly rebelling. They said that's it. We're obliterating. We want to wipe Judea off the map because the Jews had fought the Romans actually very valiantly and at one point even obliterated an entire Roman legion. I think at one point, like Bar Kokhba was actually able to push out the Romans completely, start rebuilding the temple. And one time, and, was Yeah, yeah, and we'll get to that. And we'll get to that, exactly, and we'll get to that. He even started rebuilding the temple. At one point, uh, the Roman Empire had to send something like close to half their legions just to subdue this rebellion. 100,000 people or something. Huge, huge, like more, about half their army. Imagine this massive empire and you have to send half your legions to one, you know, this one small thorn at your side that's always rebelling. So the Romans had enough and then they basically deleted Judea off all the maps, renamed it Palestine. Why Palestine? Where did they get that name? From the Plishtim, the historical enemies of the Jewish people, the biblical enemies. So they renamed it after the Plishtim, Palestine, and then joined it to Syria. They actually made it Syria, Palestine. They completely removed the boundaries. Exactly what the Gemara says here, that they were, are going to uproot the boundaries and just wipe out this whole, this whole place. So Masa Yehuda ben Bava. So there was a Rabbi Yehuda ben Bava. What did he do? So he went and sat between He sat between two big mountains, and between two cities, So between two different boundaries, And he gave smicha to five. It says zkenim, but they weren't necessarily actually old. It just means zaken is a zakana chokma, somebody who's a wise. So he gave smicha to five wise ones, and who are they? Who are the five? The same five. Good. The same five. Rabbi Meir, Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Shimon, Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Elazar ben Shamua. And Rav Avia Mosif, and also there's an opinion that Rabbi Nehemiah was there as well. So the same five students of Rabbi Akiva, 
This is basically a continuation of that story. Rabbi Akiva has been killed. He has these five students. Rabbi Yehuda ben Bava is saying, okay, what do we do now? There's very few rabbis left. He managed to sneak these five and give them smicha. Do the ceremony and give them smicha. Because Rabbi Akiva couldn't presumably do it. So Rabbi Yehuda ben Bava did it. And what happened? The Romans found out. So he told them, Rabbi Yehuda told these five students, Rutsu, go run, run for your lives. Amrulo Rebi, Mati Alecha, what's going to happen to you? And what do you think he told them? He said, Amar lahen, harini mutal lifnem ke she'en la ofrim. I'm going to implant myself here like a boulder and block the path so you guys can escape. And, lo zazom misham, ad shena atzubo shalosh meot lunbiot shel barzel. He didn't move from there until they impaled him with 300 iron spears. Vasa ahu kivra. And they made him like a sifter, basically. Like a spaghetti strainer full of holes. So that's what happened to Rabbi Akiva was killed by the Romans. Rabbi Yehuda ben Bava was killed by the Romans. So Rabbi Yehuda ben Bava managed to give smicha to those five students. And to say and save them, gave his life for it, and they escaped. And then Judaism was survived. Okay. So now you can piece all this together. So literally survived from those five rabbis to recontinue teaching and stuff? Is that what the, like the way that the Gemara phrases it is that the world was shamim, was desolate, until those five students were able to bring back, rebuild Torah and Judaism. Mm -hmm. but when and Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, Rashmi is one of them. Expelled as well from Israel already by the first, by the Romans. yeah. There was the first expulsion, right? In the year 70, the temple was destroyed right. and, and Jews were being expelled. From, uh, yeah, th Rome. there in 70, the Romans didn't force all the Jews out, a lot of them had to flee yeah. because of the circumstances. Oh. But there was a, still a Jewish presence there, and then slowly they rebuilt. And now, about 60 years later, 60 plus years later, you have Bar Kochva comes. And says it's time to fight the Romans off. Finds an opportunity to fight off the Romans. And actually builds, gathers a successful army. And Bar Kochva manages to actually kick out the Romans temporarily. Before they come back and wipe them out. The rebellion. And that's actually the next source that I wanted to read from. So we'll just read it now from the Yerushalmi. The Gemara, the Talmud Yerushalmi in Masachet Ta'anit. And it says like this. Tanei Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai, Akiva... Um, so, Rabbi Shion Bar Yochai taught that Rabbi Akiva, his teacher, would say, there's a pasuk in Bamidbar, Drach Kochav Mi Yaakov, right? The famous verse in the prophecy of Bilam, that a star will come out of Jacob, out of Yaakov, and it's supposed to refer to Mashiach, right? The Torah never openly talks about Mashiach. This is supposed to be the place where the star of Jacob is Mashiach will come. Drach Kochav Meyakov, and Rabbi Akiva would say, Drach Koziba Meyakov. Who's Koziba? That's Shimon ben Koziba, who was this military leader. So Rabbi Akiva, Kadhava Chame Bar Koziba, when he would see this man, Shimon Bar Koziba, Hu uh, Amal, Din Hu Malka Mashiach. So he would say, he's Mashiach. So Rabbi Akiva believed that Bar Koziba was Mashiach, and actually kind of nicknamed him Bar Kochva, but why the son did of the star. Like, like, because, because, because probably he was. He was the potential Mashiach of that generation. Remember, in every generation, there's a potential, right? So he was Becheskat Mashiach at that time. And remember, he was successful. He had kicked out the Romans, this evil Roman Empire. He managed to fight them off and actually managed to start rebuilding the temple. So, of course, Rabbi Akiva said, okay, well, he is, seems to be the presumptive Messiah. And Rabbi Akiva, I think, believed that by supporting him, let's all go in, all in, and maybe with our support, he'll succeed. Mm -hmm. yeah. But the majority of the rabbis didn't like that. And they didn't want to get involved in politics. Right. So this, this, the passage continues. <laughs> the passage continues that Rabbi Akiva would call Bar Koziva Bar Kochva, that who, who Malka Mashiach, he is the Melech Mashiach. And what happens? The passage continues. Amar lo Rabbi Yochanan ben Torta. He told him, his contemporary Rabbi Yochanan said, Akiva. And we've mentioned, we've cited this before. He said, Ya'alu asabim belechayecha ve'adayin ben David lo yavo. That's what he told him. He said, stop dreaming. He said, you're going to have weeds growing out of your cheeks. 
and Mashiach still won't be here. Right. Meaning, either that Rabbi Yochanan knew that Mashiach wouldn't come 2,000 years ago, that it's still far in the future, that you're going to have decomposed already, and, uh, you know, or just like, stop dreaming, buddy. Like, it's not him. Okay. But Rabbi Akiva went all in anyways. Now, what do you think happens when you are supporting, especially when you're such an important figure, like Rabbi Akiva, a religious figure, and you put all your chips, you know, on the, you make the wrong bet, and you go against the Roman Empire. And so, Rabbi Akiva supported, was part of this revolt against the Romans. So, now we can actually start to see why, what happened to him, right? Why did the Romans execute him? And what was yes, going on here? Because he believed in Mashiach? Well, he was on the wrong side. I mean, he was he on the side of the revolt, yeah. right? Against the Romans. He was preaching that Baal Kokhba is the Messiah, he's the king, right? And that's treachery, that's treason against, that's high treason against yeah, the Roman Empire, against the emperor, right? And so now we can start to go back to the beginning. The 24,000 students of Rabbi Akiva, how did they die? They died a mitara'a, a bad death. What was that death? The Roman Empire? Yeah, did they die in a plague or were they actually executed like their master? Because you can imagine what's going on. If Rabbi Akiva is on the side of Bal Kokhba and supporting him, and all his, what do you think his students did? They what were all support. The well, I don't understand. Why can't they say it? They, they... Right. And they why did. They and they did. And they did. So, and they did. So you're saying, why didn't they just say it? The Gemara doesn't say it. It just says a mitara'a. And one opinion is that it was askara. But in the time of the Geonim, remember, we, we learned from the Geonim that they actually died. They, the, the dying stopped on Lagba Omer. Another thing that we learned from the Geonim, from Igeret Shri Ragaon, he says it quite clearly, what happened. Okay, so he says what's going on. So again, if you go to the earliest sources, it actually says right clear, very clearly, it was a shmad. Okay. Shmad is a, yeah, basically a decimated, they were decimated, right, by the Romans. We're seeing here now, if we put it all together, even though it's commonly said that they died in a plague, the plague was actually the Roman Empire. And we're going to see more proof for that later on. They just had to encode it, maybe because of Roman censorship. Maybe they couldn't write, right? They couldn't write that the Romans... So they said they died a bad death. And then Rav Nachman said, okay, well, it was maybe some kind of Askara. But we're going to see how they actually encoded Askara and how that ties into the Roman Empire in a second. Okay, and this, now we, it actually starts to be clear. Now that also explains why we're mourning. Because if they died that they didn't respect each other, well then why would we, they weren't even righteous. Why would we, they couldn't even keep a basic, their, their teacher's basic, you know, main thing. But if they were killed, they were holy martyrs. Now there's a good reason to mourn. You're mourning the loss of these 24,000 martyrs, these scholars, right? That now you have a good reason for it. And Rabbi Akiba himself was killed. So that explains that. It also explains why there's a custom of playing with bows and arrows on Lagbona. You've seen this before? Like, why? there is this old custom. Was with the bows and arrows? No, just because it actually, to secretly remind us that we're actually commemorating a war here. I think one of the reasons, there is like, like Hasidic explanations for playing with a bow, because a bow is like a rainbow, whatever, but like, the simple pshat is that it's a bow and arrow is like a military weapon here, right? Mm -hmm. So, I think it was done on purpose to remind us that we're commemorating a, mil a, a military struggle. But why bring up this, this destructive notion that they didn't respect one another? Like, yeah. why, exactly. Why and now happen? that problem is solved. Because it's to make you right away know that it can't be. It's right away you have to question. Because if Rabbi Akiva's whole thing was to respect each other and love each other, and you read that all his students died by not respecting each other, right away, you know that, yeah, you know that they encoded something here. It can't be. Right? So I think that was the whole point. Uh, they put it in there so that you know that it can't be that. It must be something else. Right. But why did they choose that? A more mystical explanation. Why then did they... They could have encoded it in other ways, our sages, right? Why did they encode it like that? By saying they didn't, there was something to do with kavod and that it was a plague. Why do that? Think about the number 24,000. Where do we see that number before 24,000? Well, now we're going to go a ka yeah, <coughs> kabbalistic, cool. yeah. mystical reason. Right. Where do we see 24,000? When the Israelites were in the, in the desert, and right. there really was a plague where 24,000 
I guess Israelites died good. because of uh, what happened in Midian. Yeah. Very good. So, Bamidbar, remember there was the Midianim, that the women from Midian, Midianot, good, <laughs> that enticed specifically from the tribe of Shimon, and they had started to commit all kinds of, you know, sexual sins. And then God sent a plague, and that was the whole thing with, uh, with Pinchas, right? That he also uh, executed Zimri, remember, the, yeah. the prince of the tribe of Shimon, and 24,000 were killed then. Go back even further. Where else do we see 24,000 in the Torah? Where? Even further back. <laughs> so think about Shimon, right? Here, 24,000 died from the tribe of Shimon. Think about the Shimon, the son of Yaakov. Shem. Good. Exactly. So Shimon. Good. Remember when Shem raped Dina? Then what happened? Shimon said, okay. Yaakov said, okay, you know what? Shechem felt bad about it, said, I want to marry her, I really do love her. He said, okay, fine, but you have to get circumcised. So Shechem convinced his entire village, let's all circumcise, let's all convert, essentially. Rabbi, uh, Yaakov was happy about that, okay, they're going to be one of us, that's fine. Shimon said, no way, they raped our sister, they went and they killed everybody. So that, must, right? that must have been a, 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 a big scene they did, they did to kill the twins. Exactly, yeah. it was, and Yaakov reprimanded them. Yaakov said, what did you do? Why? And he didn't even give him a blessing, right? On his deathbed, when Yaakov was about to die, he gave all the sons a blessing. Shimon, he said, I'm not giving, Shimon and Levi, so I'm not giving you a blessing. Shimon was the main instigator. He was the older one, it was his plat. He said, I want nothing to do with them. Didn't give Shimon a blessing. And Shimon didn't even have boundaries in the land of Israel. I did, they didn't get, they didn't no, get Moshe it. also didn't give him a blessing. Moshe didn't give Shimon a blessing. Okay. Then they didn't have, they had a few cities, mainly basically around Be'er Sheva, and that's it. They didn't even have their own boundaries. They were absorbed within Yehuda. So Shimon the tw originally killed 24,000, but they had already circumcised, yes. yeah. which they means were, they that they were Jewish, Jewish souls. Jewish. Right. Yeah. He killed these Jewish souls. They were sinful, but they had converted. Shimon killed them. They get reincarnated in the 24,000 Bamidbal, the tribe of Shimon. First, the tribe of Shimon Bamidbal. Again, there's a sexual sin there. Now their final tikkun is they get reincarnated in a 24,000 students of Rabbi Akiva. And that's actually what uh, Rabbi Menachem Azario Difano says in his book. There's a great book, Sefer Gilgulei Neshamot. It's a fascinating book. Everybody should read it. Uh, Menachem Azario Difano was a student of the student of the Arizal. So the Arizal had a few, a small circle. Yeah. Right? In his own lifetime, the Arizal was basically unknown. Right? He, he, kept a, he didn't write anything. He didn't publish anything. He had a small circle in Tzfat and that's it. And Rav Chaim Vital, one of his main disciples, wrote, right, him and his son Shmuel Vital wrote most of it. There was also another one, uh, a few, it wasn't the only one. And one of the students was Rav Israel Saruk, who then went to Italy and then spread the Arizal's teachings in Italy. And he met Menachem Azaria Difano, who had a big printing press. And that's how they actually started printing more of the, the teachings of the Arizal. And so Menachem Azari Difano actually considered himself a direct disciple of the Arizal. Because, I mean, it was really close in time. It was still late 1500s, early 1600s. So he wrote, a, Rav Chaim Vital wrote Shara Gilgulim, which is the more famous book about reincarnation. Right. But it's very complicated. There's actually a much it, simpler... It's very complicated to read and it understand is. it. But there's a much simpler book, uh, which is Sefer Gilgulim Neshamot, which is not as well known. But it's actually very interesting. And just go straight like By this was Menachem Azair Difano. It's still, yeah, yeah. It yeah. still comes from the Ariza. Yeah, in, in English, everything. No English, but it's very simple Hebrew. Like you, you'd be able to understand it. It's uh, very simple. Yeah, like, the, like if you can understand this sentence, you'll understand the whole book. So that's what he says. In Sefer Gilulein Shemot, he says, V'akaf daled elef shehemit mishevet Shimon bishchem. So the 24,000 that Shimon killed in Shechem, hem akaf daled, Elif Talmidei Rabbi Akiva. Okay? Shemetu Shaloch Al Kukavod Zelazen. So now you actually understand spiritually what happened. Because it was really a tikkun from their past life that they didn't have the kavod, that they were really bad people, that they could rape another human being, God forbid. And so that was their reincarnation. So now in this life, they came back as Jews and became. Tzadikim became Torah Jews and they had one last tikkun to do and so their tikkun was to be basically killed to be decimated like that and through that they, their tikkun was completed so they were the reincarnations of those 24,000 originally yeah, so now 
we can understand why the plague, the idea of saying that it was a plague is to remind you of that whole story, right? And the, the idea of not respecting each other and the plague is to remind you of the 24,000 in the wilderness and the 24,000 of Shimon and Dina and in Shechem. Okay, so now we have the whole story pieced together. When you piece it, makes, it makes, it makes sense. But then remember what Shabbat just said, that 24,000 soldiers were killed. This right. Killed so what's interesting now is, I think, yeah, I think, and sure. this year, you know, we have Yom HaZikaron this week. And this year, for the first time, really, the number of people that are commemorated on, on Yom HaZikaron, you know, in Israel, they keep a tally of how many people, soldiers and people who were killed in terror attacks and so on. Yeah, this year, that number passed 24,000. So it's interesting that we also have now 24,000, you know, holy souls in Israel that were martyred, starting from actually from, eight, from 1860. They actually start all the way back from 1860. Yeah. You know, so we mentioned Rav Oyerbach at the beginning. So Rav Oyerbach is amazing because uh, one time he said, this was known that he said this. He said, I don't understand all these Jews who go to the graves of Tzadikim. From Jerusalem, they travel to Ukraine, to Uman, to this. He says, I don't know why they need to travel to the graves of Tzadikim when right here we have Mount Herzl and the military cemetery. And it's all Tzadikim there. They're all Tzadikim. Right. He said, they're all Tzadikim But there's only been 24,000 right. all of these which is amazing, right? Isn't that a miracle? Not enough, not enough. No, I would think it would have been a right. lot more now. Right. 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 Listen, every time when you see those, like, when you see those memorial reels and you see all these young faces that died, like, you, it makes you so sad, you know, and you cry for it. But then, you know, I, somebody once said that in Auschwitz, they killed 24,000 Jews every three days. Right? When you think about that, the Roman Empire killed 24,000 students in 33 days. And so when you think about that, and you think about here from 1860 until today, in the land of Israel, only, only 24,000. I mean, every one is a tragedy. But Exactly. When you consider all the war, Yom Kippur War, and the War of Independence, and all the terrorists, and all the, all the suicide bombers and everything. So it's interesting that we have 24,000, 24,000 again, and these martyrs, the, the theme is like 24,000 martyrs, right? Over and over again. So it's very interesting. So let's shift now to Rashbi, to Rabbi Shino, just for the last little bit and just talk about, recap his story and how he connects to this. Because really, like Baomer is, we're celebrating the teachings of Shimon Bar Yochai, who is the originator of, not the author of, but the originator of the Zohar. He didn't write the Zohar, that's another common misconception. The Zohar doesn't claim that he wrote the Zohar. No, 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 for sure no, for sure no. They didn't write anything when they were in the cave. So that came after? Yeah, yeah, we know that his students, yeah, we're going to go through the sources now. His students wrote down a lot of his teachings, and then over generations, these manuscripts were collected, and, and the Zohar itself is not one text. It's actually many texts put together, right? The Midrash Elam and the Raya Mehemna, and Idra Rabba, Idra Zuta, Yenuka, like it's many texts that were pieced together and published in the 13th century. So, but it all, it dates back to Rashbi, Shimon Bar Yochai, and his students. And Rashbi was a student of Rabbi Akiva. So let's see his story. Uh, in Nasechet Sanhedrin, it tells us, again, these five students, how they were so important, because Stam Mishnah, Rabbi Meir, so that's a famous rule. Rabbi Meir, all the Mishnahs really come from Rabbi Meir. And we know the Mishnah is like the first core texts of Jewish law, that the Gemara then debates the Mishnah. And most of that was transmitted from Rabbi Akiva to Rabbi Meir, and so on. And then Stam Tosefta is Rabbi Nechemia, which is that sixth student that may have been there as well. And that's Tosefta's are like additional teachings to the Mishnah. And Stam Sifra is Rabbi Yehuda, and Stam Sifri is Rabbi Shimon, and all of them, Bekulo Aliba de Rabbi Akiva. So it all came from Rabbi Akiva that he gave it to his students, and his students kept all of these Jewish teachings alive throughout the generations. And Rashbi specifically was famous for the, bringing the Sod, the mysticism of the Torah. He kept the secrets so the mysticism is not the Zohar? It's the Zohar plus, and, and other, mainly the Zohar, right? There's many other mystical texts. Sefer Yetzirah, Sefer Abayir, Sefer Tmunah, yeah. all, all the other is stuff. Is the Zohar Kabbalah? So but, yeah, yeah, it's the main textbook, basically, of Jewish but, mysticism, but which is Kabbalah. That, that it was Abraham, Abraham Avinu that wrote the first book in Kabbalah? Yeah, some people attribute Sefer Yetzirah to yeah. Abraham, yeah. But there are many books. <clears throat> so it all passed down to Rabbi Shimon, and then from him to his That's students. So now, in Masechet Shabbat, it tells us this story. Where do we get the story of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai in the cave? It's in Masechet Shabbat. Guess which page? 
33. <laughs> okay, Shabbat 33 uh, B tells us this story. And listen to this. Listen to how this story begins. The, the, the passage begins by Yatvi Rabbi Yehuda and Rabbi Yossi and Rabbi Shimon. Okay, actually, right before that, I'm skipping ahead a little bit, but the, the, the passage actually begins with the rabbis discussing what is Askara. Remember Askara? According to this opinion that the 24,000 students died from Askara. So they're talking about what Askara is, and suddenly we get into this discussion. Again, think of the Gemara as a code. Right? Look at how it's encoding information here. We're talking about Askara, and then in the same page, we suddenly get to these three rabbis are sitting. Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Shimon. They're sitting there, the, stu- the students of Rabbi Akiva. And sitting with them, Ve'yatev Yehuda ben Gerim Gabayhu. And with them was another guy named Yehuda, but he was a ben Gerim. He was a Roman convert to Judaism. And so this was this, like this other student that was there, but he was a Roman, maybe a spy, potentially. Probably a Roman spy that was in there. So Patach Rabbi Yehuda ve'amal. So Rabbi Yehuda has opened the discussion and said, Kama na'im ma'asen shel umazo. How nice is all the good things that the Romans do for us. Oh. Maybe he knew that this Rabbi Yehuda ben Gerim <laughs> is a spy. So he's like sitting among them and he's like, let's talk about how great the Romans are while this spy is here. And he says, Tiknu shvakim, they made like shukim for us, marketplaces, Tiknu gsharim, they made us bridges, Tiknu, uh, what's that? Merchatzaot, bathhouses for us, right? They're so great, the Romans. Rabbi Yossi, what do you think Rabbi Yossi said? Rabbi Yossi Shatak. He said, I'm not going to say anything. I'm not getting involved. And Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, you know, he doesn't care about all this. He only cares about the truth. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai said, They made it for themselves. Yeah. They did it all for themselves. He said, Why did they build all these marketplaces? Just just for their immorality, to sell their, just like today, to sell their promiscuity all over. You know, the bathhouses is just for their own pleasure, to beautify themselves. And Gsharim, why do they make all these bridges? Why do you think they built all these bridges? Exactly. Right? For, for tolls and to come here, send their tax collectors here and to take our money. And what do you think Yehuda ben Gerim, the spy, did? Yehuda ben Gerim and Right? And he went to the, straight to the Malchut and he told them what happened. So what did they decree, the government? Amru Yehuda she'ila. Well, Yehuda, he said good things about us. Okay, Ita'ale, uh, we'll promote him. He'll be one of our guys. Yossi she'shatak, we're gonna igle le tzipori. We're gonna exile him to Sepphoris, the tzipori. And Shimon, who went against us, Yereg, right? We're gonna put him, he's execution order for Shimon. What did he do? Azal u uvreya, he and his son, Rabbi Elazar, went to, to the Beit Midrash. So every day, his wife, Rabbi Shimon's wife, wife, would bring him food and water. They would hide in the Beit Midrash. The wife would bring them food. And then the search, uh, search warrant against them got even stronger. Like they started looking for them, hunting them down. Rashbi was worried that his wife would be tortured and killed. Dilma mitzare la omegale alan. They're going to torture her. They're going to kill her. She's going to tell them where we are. They both went. Azlut shube marata. They went and hid in a cave. So maybe they went to the cave without letting her know. Yeah, of course. They, they didn't want her. They just they went away so that she wouldn't hopefully also to spare her. And they went to the cave. So it rachish nisa and a, a miracle happened for them that what had happened? The carrot tree. Right. There was a charuva, a carob tree, the, and eina demaya, and a fountain of water came out. Uh, that they would go up to their tzavar, up to their neck, they would, in, in the sand, they would go uh, bury themselves in the sand, and kole yoma galsi, and they would study all day. And then it goes on to tell us that they were there, they were there for 12 years. They were hiding out in the cave, learning Torah. And then eventually Eliyahu learned with them. That's the idea that Eliyahu would come and teach them all kinds of secrets as well. And at the end, Atta Eliyahu, Eliyahu came and said, uh, He came to the opening of the cave and said, I, you know, I came to tell you, Levar Yochai, that the, the meat Kesar, that the Caesar is dead, and the Gzera has been nullified. Okay, so then the story continues. Do you remember how the story continues? Yeah, come out. Right. Nafku Chazu, they saw that people were living 
physical lives. They were so spiritual at this point. For 12 years, they just like prayed and learned Torah. Uh, it actually says how they prayed. They would come out of the dust and, and clean themselves and put on their clothes and pray. But because after 12 years of just praying, meditating, and learning Torah, when they saw people just living a physical life, it says that uh, you know, their eyes would just like burn everything. Um, that they would like literally with their eyes would burn whatever they saw. And so and a, a, a voice from heaven came out. Why did you guys come out? Did you come out? <laughs> Go back to your cave. <laughs> so... It's a, it's a beautiful story. It's, it is a beautiful story. So, so they added another 12. They went back 12 more months to cool off. Right? Uh, uh, yeah, months. 12 more months. Yeah. So total, they were there 13 years. So altogether, they were there 12 plus, plus one year. And over, I'll, I'll throw you some. I'm not going to talk about this because we don't have time. But so that one year, they learned how to like, uh, process everything? Yeah, I think they just had to like come back down to oh, earth a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> if you if you think about also this is for later for homework there is somebody else that spent 12 years and one year in very similar circumstances so think about that and you can put piece together a tikkun for that as well so but we'll leave that to cover the little loose ends here what happened to that spy Yehuda ben Gilin because oh, we forget geez. no no we forget that last line the story usually doesn't go this far, but if you scroll down a little bit or flip more. So he, after um, Rashbi, when he finally came out of the cave, he went back to the market one day. Who did he see at the marketplace one day? Yehuda ben Gerim. And what did Rashbi say? This is great. Amar, adain yesh ba'olam. Is this person still here? <laughs> And what did he do? What was his superpower? Natan bo ena ve'asau gal shel atzamot. He he put his eyes on him and turned him into a heap of bones. Oh. That's what he did. So that's how the story ends. Um, so that, that means he was an actual spy. Then. He was he was a spy, yeah, for sure. Yeah. He wouldn't kill a legitimate other another yeah. Jew. So okay. back to the why do we have black bombers? So Lag Ba'omer is, uh, it's thought that it's the day, we say that it's like the uh, Hilula, Hilula the Shel uh, Rashbi. Right, we think it's the day he died. We don't actually have any early source that says that he died, Rashbi, that the day that he died, he revealed all these deeply mystical teachings, which became the Zohar, and we are celebrating all this, like the, the, that the survival of all these deep mystical teachings and the Torah of Rabbi Akiva and all that. Lag is celebrating the mystical yeah, it's base, It's kind of like the birth of kind of like Jewish mysticism, the revelation of Jewish mysticism. It's like the Kabbalistic the holiday, beginning, the celebration no? of Kabbalah, essentially, of Jewish mysticism. The 33rd day is when that Roman plague stopped right. and Judaism was saved. That's really what it was. And that those five students then, Rashbi and Rabbi Meir, could go and take on new students and rebuild Judaism. And that actually ties into, remember, we're in Sfirat Omer, And remember that every day literally has a Sfira, like a Kabbalistic mm-hmm. trait associated with it, right? Mm-hmm. So the first day, remember, is Chesed Shebe Chesed. Remember, we have seven weeks and seven days, and each day is one of the seven lower Sfirot. So first is Chesed, and Gvura, Tiferet, Netzahod, Yisod, Malchut, right? So the first day is Chesed Shebe Chesed, and, then, and so on and so on and so on. And so what day is the 33rd day? It's Hod Shebe Hod. So, hod literally means splendor on the one hand, but hod also is the root of lehodot, which is gratitude. So we're really celebrating gratitude in gratitude. This is like really the epitome of gratitude on this day that we're grateful for this, basically the survival of the Jewish people, of the Torah, of all this. And also that same root, hod, is the root of Yehudim, right? That, that's what the root of Yehudi is to thank. When Leah named her son, she was thankful that she had another son, right? Mm-hmm. So you, the root of Yehudi is to thank, is lehodot. So it's really, hod shebehod is like, it's really like we're thankful that we are still here after all that we've been through. So that's, and, and also it means splendor of splendor. It's the majesty of the mysticism of the Torah that survived. And 33 really is the word in Hebrew, lag baomer, but lag, if you just flip it, it's gal. Gal means to reveal. And like King David says in Tehillim, 
Gal Einai, open my eyes, Vabita Niflaot Mitorotecha, right? And show God, King David asks God, open my eyes so that I can see Niflaot Mitorotecha, the secrets of your Torah. So Gal Einai literally means like open my eyes. So that's Lagba 33, Gal is 33. So it's really about opening our eyes to see deeper into the Torah and uncover it, just like we did today, that it really, it's all a puzzle, right? Torah learning is a puzzle. And the fun of it is actually piecing it all together and making sense of it and understanding it, that's how it's supposed to be done.